We're going to be in Revelation chapter 2 this morning, if you'll open your Bibles there. And we're going to jump in right into it and get uh, to work. Revelation chapter 2, as you're making your way there, did you guys hear the story about the bear attack in Sierra Madre last week? Craziest thing, just right off the 210 freeway, some guy going out for a walk in the wilderness, and he, he, he encounters two bears and one of them attacks him. Like, totally undermining my case with the missus because she is so not an outdoors kind of gal. She's been doing, speaking at retreats lately, and she was teaching at a retreat a couple of weeks ago up in the mountains. She was freaked out about bears. They had told her, hey, we have bears that come down here. They go into the cabin. She is like freaking out. I'm like, honey, the black bears, they don't mess with anybody. Yeah, famous last words. They messed with this guy. It reminds me of that story. Maybe you've heard it about the hunter that's going out to hunt for a bear, and he finds one. He draws down on it. He's about to shoot, and the bear's like, hey, hey, wait, wait, wait. Don't shoot me. Let's, come on, man. Let's work this out. Can't we reach some sort of a compromise? And the guy's like, what do you mean? He's like, I'm sure there's something. Come on. What, what are you looking for? The guy goes, well, I'm looking for a fur coat. And the bear goes, well, look, I'm just looking for a full belly. Put your rifle down. Let's talk. So he goes, all right, and he puts his rifle down. Well, the bear jumps on him, starts eating him. He's like, wait, wait, I thought you said we were going to compromise. He says, we did. I'm getting a full belly, and you're getting a fur coat. That's a courtesy laugh right there. Thank you. I appreciate it. <clears throat> we're going to talk about compromise today. Uh, Webster's Dictionary defines uh, compromise in a couple of different ways, two different definitions. First definition of compromise uh, is a noun. In the noun form, compromise means to settle differences by mutual concession. But it also appears in a verb form. And in, in the verb form, compromise means to become vulnerable to harm or to danger. And so compromise can be either or. It can be a noun or it can be a verb. But when Christians compromise the truth of God's word, it's both. It starts when you make a concession to compromise the truth. You're going to compromise the truth to give in, to get along, or whatever it might be. And then what happens is the result, by doing that, you expose yourself to danger and to harm. And this is what happens to the church of Pergamos and what we're going to look at today. We'll pick it up, chapter 2, verse 12. Jesus says, and to the church, the angel of the church in Pergamos, write, <clears throat> these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword... I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. Jesus here is addressing the church in Pergamos. Pergamos, the city, uh, was the center of pagan religion. And in this day and age, and it was filled with temples. They had three temples that were dedicated to the worship of Caesar, and then they had four other great, huge temples that were dedicated to the four main gods uh, of uh, the people of Rome. And, and so you, you, you have all of this pagan religion going on in this city, and it was in this pagan city and environment where the church of Pergamos, the Christian church of Pergamos, was planted uh, probably during the time that Paul was in Ephesus. We don't know exactly. But at any rate, Jesus begins here, and he's talking to this church, and he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, look, you guys are, are in the lion's den, man. You are just a, a, an outpost of truth in an ocean of lies. And, and, and you live, essentially, man, you live in the stronghold of satanic power, is what Jesus is saying. This is where Satan's throne is. Now, we think oftentimes of Satan that he's in hell. But the truth of the matter is, right this moment, Satan is not in hell. He doesn't get thrown into hell until we get to the events that take place in Revelation chapter 20, which is yet in our future. And so right now, Satan is free, and he is the prince of this world. And so he is, he is alive and well, just roaming about 
the earth. And this is why Peter warns us in 1 Peter 5, 8, that we are to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, lion seeking whom he may devour. So the earth is his home, <clears throat> and at the time of this writing, Pergamos was his headquarters. Now that's fitting. If you look at Pergamos, you might even want to, might want to circle the word Pergamos. And nearby you could write height or elevation. That's literally what it means. And the city of Pergamos got its name because of where it was geographically located. It was situated on a high hill. Now that makes a lot of sense that Satan would make this his throne and that it would be a place filled with pagan worship of false gods. Why? Well, if you look at Isaiah chapter 14, Jesus speaking through the prophet Isaiah, he gives us a glimpse into what makes Satan tick, what his heart and mind set is. He says this, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart... I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I also will sit on the mount of the congregation <clears throat> on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And so it's fitting that Satan would establish his earthly throne there in Pergamos. I don't know where Satan's throne is today, it is certainly somewhere, um, but at this time, uh, it was there in Pergamos up on this tall hill. So true to his ambition, Satan centered his throne in this high city and he went to work. So lies, deceit, false religion, just taking place there. And Jesus, as he does with most of the seven churches here in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, what Jesus is doing, he begins with words of commendation. Words of commendation. He's, he, say, he, he wants to encourage them in the things that they're doing, right? And so he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name. If you're taking notes, you can write this down, this first commendation. Jesus commends the church for combating temptation. Commending them for combating temptation. Temptation. And again, let me just throw this out at this point, that as we read through these churches and we read what they're commended for, and then we read what Jesus' words of correction for them is, that this is instructive for us. It's not just written to the church 2,000 years ago. Yes, it was written to these very real, very particular churches 2,000 years ago, but it is also written to you and me today because we are the church. And so what we need to do, and the danger is, is that as he writes to a church, and he commends them for something, we have a tendency to think in our minds, well, I'm being commended for that. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. When he commends someone for doing it, we have to take a walk with it and say, am I doing that thing or would it be for me a word of correction because I'm not doing that thing? And so we need to pray about that. And so Jesus commends them for combating temptation. We have to take a walk with, do I combat temptation? And notice what Jesus says there. He says, I know where you dwell. That word dwell literally is talking about a permanent residence. That's the idea. In other words, these guys didn't commute in to the, to the hood to, to do church and then go back to their house in the suburb. No, they lived there. And Jesus says, I know exactly where you're living. You live in an oppressive, spiritually speaking, place. You live in darkness and, 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 and I get it that you live in a really tough neighborhood, that you're surrounded, that the city and the culture that you live in are all worshiping false gods. And, and this isn't too much of a stretch for you and I to identify in some ways with the Church of Pergamos because we're surrounded as well, aren't we? False religions, so the, those worshiping the God of sex, the God of money, the God of fame, the God of pleasure, the God of amusement, the God of self. I mean, we are surrounded by this. It's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It's in our cities. It's in our workplace. It's in our neighborhoods. It's in our schools. And, and in fact, we often bring it into our own homes by way of the television and the internet. And so surrounded by all of these evil, 
false religions, false doctrine, idol worshiping, this is where they live. Jesus says, look, I, I know where you live. But he says to them, look, you're hanging in there. You're holding fast to my name. Second point, if you want to write it down, Jesus commends the church for their committed testimony. Not just their combating temptation. Hey, you live in, you live in the hood, spiritually speaking, and you're, 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 you're maintaining and you're doing good. <clears throat> but he says also, look, you also live in a place where you're persecuted and you're committed in your testimony. He says there in verse 13, you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas, Antipas was my faithful witness or my faithful martyr who was killed among you. Antipas is one of the great anonymous heroes of the Bible. And what I mean by that is that this is the only reference to him. We really don't know who he was. We don't know really anything about him beyond what the text tells us here. Uh, we don't know, you know how he died. We don't know really the particular circumstances under which he died. But we can take some clues about the guy from the text that we have here. And the first thing to take note of is just his very name. The name Antipas means against all. And certainly it would seem fitting for this man because he was against those who would tempt him to renounce his faith. Remember, in this day and age, the church was under incredible persecution. If you stood up to witness, uh, to be a witness of Christ, it would often cost you your life, which is why Jesus gives him another name. He's got the name of, hey, of, of against all, but Jesus says, I'm going to also give you another name. I'm going to call you a faithful witness or a faithful martyr. Now, <clears throat> the word martyr literally means witness. That's, that's what it means. We understand it. If we use the word martyr, martyr today, we understand it of, oh, you, you were killed for your faith. You were killed for witnessing about Jesus Christ. Well, the reason we understand that is because of the first century church. Prior to that, the word martyr simply meant a witness. But then all of a sudden Christians started getting killed for their faith, and so now it's synonymous with being killed for your faith. Now, let's be honest. We as Christians in Temecula, there's not a lot of Christians being killed for their faith. But we do face persecution, don't we? There are times when you take a stand for Christ, whether it's with your college professor or whether it's with you know, your employer or whether it's with the people you work with, even your own family. You take a stand for Christ and you will be persecuted for your faith. I mean, my son Scotty, you know, acting in Hollywood, we, we would take a stand for Christ and we would face persecution. I, I remember one particular situation, he had the opportunity, they wanted to hire him to, to do a movie with Natasha Kinski in, in Russia, but we had to pass on the project because we couldn't get him to change the script and the script was not God-honoring. Um, and so we're, we're, you know, where Scotty's part was concerned, and they, they, they were going to make some concessions and change it, but it wasn't really changing the essence of what was being conveyed. They were just going to use somebody to stand in for him and change the camera angle. I'm like, that, we're not going to do that. Now, interestingly enough, when we passed on that, it opened up the opportunity for Scott to go to work on Seventh Heaven, and he ended up working for the next three seasons on, as, a, as a season regular, you know, a series regular on the show. And, and praise the Lord, that's great. But ironically, the Christian persecution that Scotty faced was the most on the set of Seventh Heaven. And, um, and, you know, it was, it, was, it was really tough. In fact, there was one guy who uh, was, was also a Christian on the set, and they fired him for his witness. See, it's a lot easier to fire somebody on the other side of the camera. It's a lot, it's a lot harder to fire the talent uh, when, you know, Scotty taking a stand for his faith, still suffering persecution, but the, the poor guy who was the grip, his name was George, they fired him for his Christian witness. And, um, and so, you know, they, they told him it was something else, but we knew exactly why they had fired him. We, and, you know, it, was, it wasn't that much of a secret. The, the, the point is, is that, listen, we all face persecution. And one of the big takeaways here, as I look at Antipas, is that, I mean, he's, he's really lost 
into obscurity. Other than what is said about here, we don't know anything about him. So he's kind of lost to history, and sometimes we feel that way when we're taking a stand for Christ. If it costs you your job, or if it costs you a relationship, or whatever. And a lot of times we feel alone. We feel abandoned. We feel like, you know, this is really difficult. Well, listen, notice who takes notice of this. Jesus Christ himself. He calls them out by name and says, I'm, I'm well aware. As a matter of fact, not only is he aware of the cost, the per, great personal cost that Antipas paid ultimately with his life, but he gives to him a new name. Not only was he, was he a, you know, Antipas, who, who would, you know, not, he, who would be against all who would try to lead him astray, but Jesus says, well, I'm going to call you a faithful witness. Now, the significance of that is that is the title that Jesus reserved for himself, that he used to refer to himself. And so Jesus saying, you know what? I was a faithful witness unto death. And Jesus would say, he was like me, a faithful witness unto death. The, the, the most encouraging thing that we can see from this is Jesus says, I know, I care, and I see it. Well, continuing now in verse 14, Jesus switches. He goes from the commendations that he gives to this church. Now he's got some words of correction for this church. He says in verse 14, But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block <coughs> before the children of Israel to eat things uh, sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. And thus, verse 15, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. And so Jesus here, he's, he's, he's offered the words of commendation. Now he offers these words of correction. Next point, if you're taking notes, Jesus chastises the church for their compromising tolerance. Now listen, let me just say this, that we're going to spend a lot of time on this next point. And it's critically important because tolerance is the word of the day, is it not? And there's a lot of confusion within the church of what is tolerance and what should it look like? And so Jesus is going to answer that question for us here in his word, and, and we need to pay attention. It is every bit as relevant today, and we need to take heed that he's, he's, he's telling this church that lives in a day and an age very much like our day and age, he's telling the church of Pergamos, look, I got something against you. I have to correct you because you're compromising in the area of tolerance. Okay, so let's figure that out. What does he say? Well... He cites two distinct areas of compromise. He says that they hold to the doctrine of Balaam, and he says that they hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And, and not that they are holding to it, but very distinctly he says you have inside your church those people that are holding to this and you're tolerating them. And so the, the doctrine of Balaam, let's, let's, what is that? Balaam was an Old Testament prophet, and he could be bought, okay? He makes the Clinton Foundation look like Mother Teresa, okay? And so Balaam basically is, is there, prophet of God and all, and, and Balak, who is the, the king of Moab, he's afraid of the Israelites, and so he pulls Balaam aside, says, look, I know you're a prophet of God, so uh, how much can I pay you to, to have you prophesy against Israel, can, can, can you prophesy against Israel so that I can beat them in battle and I'll, I'll, I'll pay you handsomely? And, and, and so Balaam is like, wow, I'm all about the payday, man. Let me go talk to God. So he goes to God and God's like, are you high? No, that's my paraphrase. But God's like, no, I'm not gonna, you, can't, you, can't, you can't prophesy against my people for money. I'm not going to let you do it. So Balaam goes back to Balak and he's like, God's not going to let me do it. Doggone it. He'll, well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you. You pay me. I'll tell you how you can get them to compromise. How about that? And so Balak's like, okay, cool. Tell me how to do it. 
And so what, what Balaam tells him is, he says, look, if you can get the Israelites to hook up with the Moabite women, then they'll compromise themselves and they'll bring a curse upon themselves. So you arrange a booty call and then everything will be cool. This is what he's saying to them. And so this is the doctrine of Balaam, all right? Now, what, what it does is it brings idolatry and fornication into Israel. Now hold that thought. Jesus also says that they hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, this doctrine is a little less clear, but essentially the idea is that the Nicolaitans thought it was okay to mix pagan worship with Christianity. Okay, And so there's all of these false religions and, and pagan worship. And we know that some of the pagan worship you know, practices were, were you know, very sexual in nature. There were actually temples set up with you worshipped in that particular pagan religion by actually engaging in sexual practices with prostitutes and all. And so you marry these two things together. You've got the doctrine of Balaam and you've got the, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And it's a toxic mixture for a church. Toxic mixture of compromise. And so, notice what Jesus says in verses 14 and 15. He says that his problem is, you have there those that are engaging in this. Now, it's critical that we understand what's being said here. Because Jesus has commended the church in general for not compromising their witness. So he's saying, listen, I know that, that most of y'all are, are being high and tight and you're not compromising your witness. You're in the midst of a pagan generation and you yourselves are not embracing the pagan practices and, and you're being persecuted for your faith and you're not altering from that. And he says, that's cool, but he says, you have there those. In other words, you have within your church those that are engaging and, and embracing the doctrine of Balaam and, and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, this toxic mixture of sexual compromise. And what you are doing as a church is you're saying tolerance. You know what? Come on in. It's cool. Uh, and, and you, you just, they're just allowing it to come into their church. Now, hold that thought and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 for a while, so you're going to all want to turn over there. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll pick it up in verse 1. Just to your left, a few books, <coughs> several books. Still in the New Testament, obviously. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1 is where we'll start. Here's what Paul says. Now, Paul's writing this letter to the church of Corinth, and they got a similar gig going on. They're, they're, like, um, they're, they're like the church that, the, the Pergamos that we're dealing with in, in Revelation. Same thing. So he says in verse, five, or verse 1 of chapter 5, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. Have you heard the, the, the saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans do? Even the Romans didn't do what Paul is talking about. That's what he says here. And here's what he says the problem is. He says you've got this sexual immorality, and the, the Romans won't even do it, that a man has his father's wife. Yuck, right? Now, is this the, that the, the son, is, and when he says a man has his father's wife, it's talking about in a sexual sense. So is this saying that, you know, the son and mom are hooking up? Is this saying it's his stepmom and they're hooking up? I don't know. It's just, it's just Kentucky weird is what it is. This is like your family tree goes straight up and down kind of stuff, all right? Now, what, what he says here, he says it's reported that there is sexual immorality. And you could, you could circle that phrase. And, and nearby, you could write sex that is forbidden by law. Now, this is a junk drawer term. You got a junk drawer at home? I, I got one. It's usually in your kitchen, right? What's in your junk drawer? Junk, you know, screwdriver, roll of tape, you know, maybe, you know, a cord for a phone and, and a 50 million other things. It's just it's 
bursting out. You can barely get the thing closed, right? This is a junk drawer term used for all sexual immorality, okay? So why? Because people are sneaky, that's why. And so if, if the Bible doesn't specifically mention your certain sexual sin, then what people will do is they'll insist, hey, well, it's okay, because the Bible doesn't talk about that. You ever heard somebody say, Jesus never talks about homosexuality? Yeah, he never talks about, you know, child molestation either. But it doesn't mean it's okay. All right? And so this is the term here. Paul is, is saying sexual immorality. It's all of the above. See, because when the Bible talks about sex, it says this very clearly. Don't do anything where sex is concerned except this. Get married, be faithful to your spouse, and keep your sexual relationship between you and your married spouse. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible means. Anything outside of that is sexual immorality as far as the Bible is concerned. And so Paul says here, hey, there's this sexual immorality taking place, and it's taking place inside the church. And, and not only is it forbidden by God's law, but he says this is even perverse to the Gentiles, what's going down here. So if you believe the gay pride line, which basically says two consenting adults are free to do whatever they want, and who are we to judge? That's their line. So by that definition, what we're reading about here in the, act, the specific activity that's going on, that would be okay as far as their, their worldview goes. Now, Paul says, as we continue, well, actually, and before I move on, that would be their line. That's the Church of Corinth's line as well. That's what we have to take note of. That's their response. Hey, you know what? Two consenting adults, and, and, and who are we to judge? And Paul's going, oh my gosh, are you kidding? It shouldn't be, shouldn't be anybody's response, especially the church's response, but hey, church in Corinth, that's your response. Jesus saying, hey, church of Pergamos, that's your response. And I got a big problem with that. And so uh, as, as we continue here, Paul says in verse 2, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. Now, it's interesting he uses that phrase, puffed up. He says, look, this is going down inside your church. This, this, this man is engaged in this sex, sexual activity with his father's wife, and, and you guys are all puffed up about it. Now that word puffed up, we get the word bellows from that Greek word puffed up. And it's a metaphor meaning being puffed up with pride. And he says, you're all puffed up with pride about this. You're not mourning over this going, that, you shouldn't be doing that. You're saying, come on into the church, dude. You're welcome. Have a seat. What Paul says is, look, you're proud of it. You, 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 got, you got buttons, you got bumper stickers, you, you're having parades, you're, you know, hey, we're tolerant, we're diverse, we're open-minded. Because God's a God of love, and who are we to judge? And he says, shouldn't you rather have mourned? And the idea is this, this should just break your heart. As Christians, it just should, you know, when you see a fellow Christian taking that attitude, your heart should just be broken over it. And he says, shouldn't you rather that that person who did this be taken away? That phrase, taken away, it literally means to lift up and remove. I had a buddy I used to work with in the fire department. He came home one day, found his 15-year-old engaged in some inappropriate activity with a 19-year-old man on his couch. Now, what do you think that father did? You think he walked in and went, oh, I'm sorry, as you were. No, he lifted up and removed this person. Let's put it that way, okay? No jury convicted him. <laughs> he didn't go to jail for what he did, but let's just say he lifted up. He took out the trash is what he did, okay? He lifted it up and he removed it. And, and so the, 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 the thing here is that 
Paul is saying that's what we have to do when we have Christians who come into the church. Who, and, and again, let's, let, let, me, let me specify, just clarify. Paul's talking about Christian church with Christian members. He is not talking about the unbelieving world. I don't have time to get into it, but if you want to read it on your own, just in the same chapter, you get to verses 9 through 11, and Paul clarifies. He goes, look, I'm not talking about the unsaved world. Paraphrase Paul. He's like, I'm not talking about that. Because, it, you know, the unsaved world is the unsaved world. They're going to act like unsaved people. It's hard enough for Christians to act like Christians. So, so if, if the unsaved world comes into the church service, Maybe some of you today, you, you have not surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You're absolutely welcome to come in here. Because you, you're here, I want you to hear the word. We want to minister the gospel to you so you can discover and know the truth. And we want you to be delivered by the Holy Spirit of God from darkness to light. From death to life. That's our hope for you. And so you're welcome. Come in here. But what happens is, is that if you come... And you recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord, then, and you say, I want to surrender my life to you, then what happens is that Jesus comes to live inside of you. You call him Lord, which means that you are, hey, I'm the slave, he is the master. That's what it means. And, and so what happens is, is that the Bible says, you are not, you don't belong to you. That you as a Christian, that, that you belong to God, that you were bought with a price. The price was he died on the cross for your sins in your place. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. And so if you're here today and you have not surrendered to Jesus Christ, the, 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 the short version of that is to say that you have not met God's righteous standard. You've earned a paycheck for the way that you've lived on this earth. And that paycheck is death. But the Bible says God loves you and he doesn't want you to die. We're talking about not only physical death, but we're talking eternal death. God doesn't want you to die. So he sent his son. His son died on the cross for your sins in your place. So if you say, I want to be saved, I want to be rescued, I want, I want you to come in and, and save me, God, he will do that. Now you belong to him. And when you belong to him, then you do not have the right to be able to come to church and, and, you know, say, I want all the benefits, but I want to continue to live like hell. You don't have that right. God says, no, you, you, I own you. I died for you. And, and, and so this is the idea here. And so Paul, you know, when, when, he's, when he's saying, look, you got somebody, you got a, you got a person who is who is a professed believer in Jesus Christ, who's living in sin, you can't keep him there in the church. You can't allow him to stay. you gotta, you got to remove him. Now, he says something very significant in the next few verses. Verse 3, uh, he says, For I indeed, as absence in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present, him who has so done this deed... In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together <clears throat> along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> deliver such a one, the person who is, is engaged in this sexual immorality, who calls themselves a follower of God, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus." There is this nonsensical idea that unless you know me, unless you know all about me, then you can't judge me. Hey man, God knows my heart. You don't know my heart. You don't get to judge me. You don't know what I've been through. Paul says, hey look, I'm not even there and I've already made the call. Yeah, I don't, I don't need all the information. You know, it, it's not like the Bible says, hey, you know, don't have sex with your stepmom unless she's really hot. The Bible doesn't give you that caveat. The Bible just says you're not to be engaged in sex outside of the covenant of marriage. The Bible doesn't say, hey, don't have sex with your boyfriend or with your girlfriend, you know, unless you're, 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 you're really, 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 really in love. The Bible doesn't say that. It says, hey, there's a covenant of marriage and that's where that belongs. The, the Bible doesn't say, 
hey, you know, avoid the appearance of evil unless, hey, it's more convenient for you to shack up together, in which case knock yourselves out because, you know, your circumstances don't allow you really to, to maintain two separate homes and, and uh, you know, uphold the appearance of, of righteousness and remove yourself from the temptation that, quite frankly, if you shared the same house and the same bed, you could not resist those temptations. The Bible's very wise when it tells us to, to, to flee our youthful lusts and to do that. And the Bible doesn't say to do that and then give you the caveat that says, but hey, you know what? If your circumstances are tough and you know, you've got more month than money and all that, and then you guys can, you can live together, that's okay. The Bible doesn't say that. It doesn't give you that option. Everybody thinks they're the exception to the rule, but you're not. The Bible has a standard. The Bible says this is the way you're to live. And God, you know, he doesn't give you that standard because he wants to ruin your life. He gives you that standard because he knows what is going to destroy you. And so he says, this is the way you must live because I know what's best for you. And as a loving father, this is what I'm telling you. And so what Paul says is he goes, look, I've already judged the guy. They're like, well, Paul, you don't have all the information. Paul would say, I have all the information I need. Okay, I've already judged him. And, and what's the prescription for a believer in Christ who wants to live in habitual sin? And that needs to be stressed because we're not talking about somebody who says, oh, man, I'm such an idiot. I went online and I did something I shouldn't have done. We're not talking about somebody who says, oh, you know, gosh darn it. I'm, I'm just, man, I... God, forgive me, I did this thing. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the person who continues in a habitual lifestyle of sin, who is unrepentant, and who wants to be able to come into Christian fellowship, come into church, and continue to, to name the name of Christ, but to live like hell. And Paul says, no, 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 that one gets delivered to Satan. Now you go, well, that sounds cruel. It's anything but. In fact, it's quite loving. See, because as a Christian, you've got two options. When you're living in sin, you can either repent or you can face discipline. Now, if you repent, there's love, there's support, there's grace, there's mercy. There's, there's the, hey, the church isn't going to push you away, it's going to pull you in. The church is going to say, hey, we want to walk with you, we want to encourage you, we want to acknowledge, hey, we're all struggling with sin, we all have sinful practices, we don't want you to fall into the condemnation of the devil, we want to encourage you, hey, a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up again, this is what we want to do. And that is, all that is predicated on repentance. But if there is no repentance, then the only thing that's left is discipline. The discipline is, we're going to hand you over to Satan. What does that look like practically? What it looks like practically is to say, look, you don't get the privilege to continue coming to the church and being in Christian fellowship if that's the way you're going to choose to live. If that's the way you're going to choose to live, and yet you're going to say that you're a Christian, what we're going to do is we're going to put you outside the church and say, you can't keep coming here. You can't get the, keep getting the support and the nurturing because then what we're doing is we're just enabling you in that. It's not unlike the, the, the father who says to, to his, his drug addict child, listen, if I just keep, you living, keep letting you live here and paying your rent and paying your bills, all I'm doing is enabling you in this self-destructive behavior. And so guess what? You can't live here anymore. Now, th that illustration wasn't in my notes, and then the Lord just laid it on my heart in the middle of preaching last service, second service, as I was preaching it, and I had a father come up to me in tears afterwards. He says, that word was for me because I just did that with my son. And God loves you. He's a loving father. So he says, look, if you're going to be a child of God and you're going to act like that, then at pretty soon there's going to come a point when I'm going to say, I'm not going to enable your behavior and you need to be put out of the church. And that's exactly God's point, Jesus' point to the church of Pergamos. He goes, you can, you're just welcoming everybody in. Paul saying here to the church of, uh, of Corinth, you're just welcoming everybody in. Hey, it's okay. You know what? We're tolerant. And so you put them outside of the fellowship. And, the, and it's not to destroy them. What you're looking to do is to destroy their desire for sin. That's what you're looking to do. That they can come back humbly and ready to, re, to repent. That, that when you turn them over, that Satan will start having his way with them. And they'll hit something hard and recognize, I need to return to my father's house. It's, not, it's exactly like the prodigal son 
who went out and blew everything on prodigal living, and now he finally wound up in the pig pen and remembered, I had it so much better at my father's house. What happened to him? The world and Satan had their way with him. And that's the whole point here. Turn him over to Satan, let him beat him up for a while, and they'll come to their sentences and want to come back home. And so Paul says in verse 6, he says, Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? You know what leaven is, right? It's, it's yeast. And you take, you take a, a, a batch of dough, and you take a tiny pinch of yeast, and you throw it in there, and it'll work its way through the entire ball of dough. And what yeast does, literally, is it rots the dough. And as the dough begins to rot, the gases are released, and that's what causes dough to rise. And you stick it in the oven, and you bake it, and then you cut it into slices, and all those nooks and crannies that hold the butter so good, that's gas bubbles that have created all of that. Okay? Picture of sin, by the way. Oh, it's so tempting. Looks so good. A moment on the lips and a lifetime on the hips, man. You know, it's just, that's the picture of sin. And so what Paul is saying is he goes, he says, look, if you as a church want to be tolerant of this sexual immorality, and you want to say, we're tolerant, love, grace, God's a God of love, we love you, come on in, keep living like you're living, he goes, it's going to rot the whole church. And what's going to happen is their sexual immorality is going to spread to somebody else who's going to become sexually immoral, who's going to be compromised. And he says the whole church is going to go down the tubes because you're all going to be compromised. Now some of you yet, even with all that explanation, you're still struggling with this idea. You're like, wait a minute, didn't Jesus say not to judge? Yeah, he did. Matthew chapter 7 verse 1, I'll put it on the screen. He says, judge not that you be not judged. Judged. Now, what Jesus is talking about there is hypocrisy. What it, I'll illustrate for you this way. It's like if you said to your friend, hey, you know what? I was talking to my fifth wife yesterday after I got home from my drunken binge, and we, we agreed <clears throat> that you've got a bad marriage and you need to do something about it. Now, that's, that's hypocrisy. And, and so the, the, the idea there, Jesus, as he's speaking, he's talking about, look, Take the log out of your own eye before you look at the splinter in your brother's eye. And the, 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 the point is, is that if you spend your whole life looking at everybody else, well, then you're never going to focus on yourself and on your walk. But listen, if you are honestly committed to being serious about your faith and about your walk with the Lord, and then you commit yourself to growth and accountability in the Christian community... Well, then what Jesus says is that judgment is part of the package. See, the Bible says is that, is that we are to examine one another and to spur one another on, one another on towards love and good deeds. The, 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 the word that, that, that is used, is, it, it's like scopio. It's like, you know, I'm looking intently at your life. We're, we're called to look intently at one another's lives. Now, we don't like that. We pull the, the Wizard of Oz. Don't pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. You don't look at me, look at yourself. But the Bible makes it clear that a healthy community of believers needs to have each other's backs. And when, what we're doing is we're not intently looking at one another to tear one another down or to gossip about one another or anything like that. It is to spur each other on towards love and good deeds. That's why we're supposed to be considering one another. And so, so, so there is that, that, that relationship that God's built into the church. This is how we're supposed to function. Judgment is part of the package. I love this quote from A.W. Tozer. He said, we can't afford to let down our Christian standards just to hold the interest of people who want to go to hell and still belong to a church. See, we as brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to spur one another on. We need to be encouraging one another. And sometimes that means that we say, brother, your zipper's down, metaphorically speaking. And because I love you, I'm going to tell you that. 
And that's exactly, as we turn back to Revelation 2 and finish now, this is exactly what Jesus says. Look at what he says there in verse 16. He says, repent. You guys are enabling Christians, your brothers and sisters in Christ, to bring sexual immorality into the church. And you need to repent. He says, and if you don't, he says, repent or else... I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Listen very carefully what Jesus is saying. He says, church, you do something about it or I'm going to do something about it. One of us is going to do something about it. I want you to do something about it. But if you won't, I'll take matters into my own hands. I'll do something about it. And notice what he says there. I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Go back to the very beginning in verse 12. As he introduces himself to the church of Pergamos, he says, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. This is a reference to Jesus' word, and this is what this all comes down to. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And what Jesus is saying here is that we as a church need to, by his word, by the compass of his word, we need to be able to say, listen, I know what you're doing, and God knows what you're doing, and I know you think what you're doing is all right, but God's word says it's not right. And so you need, to, you need to repent and you need to stop what you're doing. And Jesus is saying here in verse 16, either you do this as a church or I'm going to have to come do this. Verse 17, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give him some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written which no one knows except him who receives it. Now you're like, what is that all about? It's a really simple explanation. When he says, I'm going to give you some of the hidden manna, this is a reference to Jesus, the bread of life. When he says, I'm going to give you a white stone with a special name on it, well, what would happen in this day and age is that a Roman athlete, when they, would, when they would compete, if they won the competition and became champions, they would receive a white stone and it had their name engraved on it and that white stone was an all-access pass to get them into the banquet. And so you have this together, Jesus, the bread of life, and you have this access path and really, what's, what Jesus is saying here is summed up in what he says in Revelation 3, verse 20. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Listen, a lot of times we'll cite this verse when we're talking to unbelievers and we will say, listen, Jesus, right now, he's standing at the door of your heart. He's knocking. He's inviting you in. And he promises that if you'll receive him as Lord and Savior, he'll come in and he'll give you, the, you know, cleansing of your sin and, and fellowship with him. And certainly that is true. But, you know, the context of what Jesus says this here in, in chapter 3, we'll see it in a few weeks when we get there. He's talking to his church. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, I'm standing at the door of my own church, knocking on the door of my own church, and y'all won't let me in. Jesus is saying here, listen, we as followers of him, we as a body of believers, we cannot be a compromising church. And specifically, we cannot be those that say, hey, you know what? It's cool. We're tolerant. Whatever, whatever floats your boat, man. Come on in here. You're welcome here. We can't do that. Love demands that we don't do that. 